distinguished chiefs of Navy, heads of maritime coast guards, the maritime police, heads of delegations, and distinguished delegates. I would first like to thank the organizers of the IONS 2014, especially Mr. Andrew Forbes, for giving me this opportunity to speak at this distinguished forum. As I have sought naval cooperation in the control of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing in the South China Sea just a few months ago in a paper that I wrote. Before I go into the heart of my paper, I would like to place on record my deep appreciation to the Australian Navy and all others who are assisting Malaysia in the search for the ill-fated Malaysian Airlines MH370. My paper is titled, A Review of the Passage Regimes in Straits Used for International Navigation under the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention, Implications for Navies. And I am from the University of Malaya, as introduced by the chair. The University of Malaya is a public research university that was founded in 1949. It's located in Kuala Lumpur. It is the oldest and considered the top university in Malaysia. I'm looking for the... Now, the abstract uh, says that I will discuss the challenges faced by the international community of states in drawing up the nature of passage in straits used for international navigation. This paper in particular uh, argues that navies should play an active role in environmental protection, specifically in the conduct of baseline studies for environmental protection and resource conservation. To this end, I have the following table of contents. An introduction followed by a review of the Straits and Passage regimes before the adoption of the 1982 convention. Six Straits and the three Passage regimes under the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention, followed by the way forward and conclusions. The 1982 Law of the Sea Convention was adopted following the consensus principle and the package deal nature of the conference, UNCLOS III. The freedom of navigation on world's oceans was balanced against competing challenges of coastal and user states. The Loss Convention has 320 articles set out in 17 parts and nine annexes. The loss has 166 states parties and it entered into force on 16th November 1994 following the deposit of the 60th instrument of ratification by Guyana. The section on review of straits and passage regimes before the 1982 loss examines decisions of the Permanent Court of International Justice, a decision of the International Court of Justice, the 1958 Geneva Convention on the Territorial Sea and Contiguous Zone, the 1960 and the 1960 Geneva Conference on the Law of the Sea. Part three of the loss examines the current challenges to the transit passage regime and straight states' obligations towards the marine environment. The way forward, as mentioned earlier, is naval assistance in the baseline study for marine environmental protection. Now, the four cases I'm going to look at uh, briefly are the SS Wimbledon case, the SS Lotus case, the I'm Alone case, the Coffew and the Coffew Channel case. Now, the SS Wimbledon in this case, the Permanent Court of International Justice pointed out that as a result of Article 380 of the Versailles Treaty of Peace, the Kiel Canal had ceased to be an internal and national navigable waterway. 
and had become an international waterway for the benefit of all the nations of the world. The court held that when an artificial waterway connecting two open seas has been permanently dedicated to the use of the whole world, such waterway is assimilated to natural straits. However, the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention has adopted a different approach towards the classification of straits used for international navigation using geographical criteria and one legal criterion. In the SS Lotus case, the Permanent Court of International Justice upheld the ship as a floating territory of the flag state. However, the 1982 Law of Sea Convention does not uphold this principle of floating territory. In the I Am Alone case, the question was the exercise of the right of hot pursuit by two US Coast Guard ships and where one of them deliberately sank the pursuit vessel engaged in illicit smuggling of liquor under the 1929 Liquor Convention. The commissioners held that the use of force for the purposes of the convention was acceptable and included an accidental sinking of the vessel. But the deliberate sinking was neither justified by the convention nor any principle of international law. In the Corfu Channel case, the International Court of Justice held that the Corfu Channel constituted an international strait, as the decisive criteria was its geographical position, connecting two parts of the high seas, and its function of being used for international navigation. The 1982 Law of the Sea Convention builds on this case. At the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea 1 and 2, both these conferences failed to agree on the breadth of the territorial sea. UNCLOS 1 agreed to the concept of the territorial sea and a 12-mile contiguous zone, which eventually was adopted in the 1958 Geneva Convention on the Territorial Sea and Contiguous Zone as reflected in Article 16.4. The contiguous zone was recognized in Article 24, Paragraph 2 of the same convention. Now, Part 3, 1982 of the Law of the Sea Convention deals with straits used for international navigation. There are six straits and three passage regimes. Now on the categories of straits, the part three of the Lost Convention used a combination of geographical criteria such as high seas, the exclusive economic zones, territorial seas, islands, and legal criteria such as the use of the straight baseline method and came up with six types of straits. These six categories are as follows. One, straits where a high seas or EZ corridor runs through the middle. Second, straits formed by high seas or exclusive economic zones. Third, straits situated between a part of the high seas and EZ and the territorial sea of a foreign state. Four, the strait formed by, by island of strait state and its mainland. Five, or fifth, straits governed by long-standing conventions. And, and the sixth category is where straits which were previously territorial seas, but now are considered internal waters by the use of strait based lines. Three passage regimes are the transit passage, the non-suspendable innocent passage, and innocent passage. These diagrams that are now shown on the screen are taken from S. N. Nandan and D. H. Anderson, Straits Used for International Navigation, a commentary on part three of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea in 1982. Citation, 1989, 60, year, British Yearbook of International Law at pages 159 and 199 to 204. Now the first category 
Uh, the diagrams are small. I do apologize for that. But the first category is where straits have a high seas or EZ corridor running through the middle. This is a reflection of Article 36, and the authors point out, but because the uh, high seas are wide and navigable, the regime of passage available in the straits is innocent passage. The next uh, diagram is also a reflection on Article 36, but here the only difference is the high seas corridor is narrow and non-navigable. Hence, the authors point out that transit passage is now available in such straits. The second category focuses on straits formed by high seas or EZ. This is, article, this is a reference to Article 37 straits where the, uh, well, traditionally the regime of transit passage would prevail. But here the authors point out that a vessel from one port decides to cross over to a vessel across the strait to another port. Therefore, the authors find out that in such cross traffic, innocent passage should prevail across the straits. The third category the authors use is the strait situated between a part of the high seas and EZ and the territorial sea of a foreign state. This is a reference to Article 45, and the authors point out that the regime of non-suspendable innocent passage prevails in such straits. The fourth category the uh, authors have highlighted refer to a strait formed by an island of a strait state and its mainland. This is a reference to Article 38, Paragraph 1 of the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. And it says, it points out, that the regime of non-suspendable innocent passage prevails in these straits. The last diagram is a reference to Article 38, Paragraph 2, and it refers to transit passage in straits. There is a vessel uh, in the high seas wishing to proceed across the strait used for international navigation to the other part of the high seas. As the strait is connected, uh, strait connects two parts of the high seas, the authors point out that transit passage prevails in such straits. Now the challenges in transit passage is as follows. There is the rights and duties of user states versus the rights, duties, jurisdiction, and discretion of straight states. On the rights and duties of user states, the transit passage regime, as pointed out by the chair earlier, is a stronger regime than the innocent passage for the territorial seas in part two, as a coastal state cannot stop, hinder, impair, or obstruct transit passage. The Law of the Sea Convention has not drawn up a list of activities that if flag states engage in will render transit passage unlawful, except for a reference in Article 39, Paragraph 1, clauses B and C which refers to use of force against the political independence or territorial integrity of the coastal state or a violation of Article 2, 4, Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter. Transit passage also has implications for the exercise of contiguous zone jurisdiction of straight states. Their rights of hot pursuit and the use of signals in hot pursuit from the contiguous zone. Some might argue that straight states' exercise of contiguous zone jurisdiction interferes with transit passage rights. Where user states show hostile intent under Article 39 during transit, it would be difficult for straight states to respond under Article 39 and Articles 39 and 301. Article 301 provides that states are to refrain from any threat or use of force inconsistent with the UN Charter. Article 39 does not impose any duty on ships and aircraft exercising their right of transit passage to obey the national laws of straight states. They are to proceed without delay, refrain from any threat or use of force against straight states, or act in any manner in violation of the UN Charter. They are to refrain from any activity outside their mode of transit 
unless rendered necessary for force measure, by force measure or distress. This again was alluded to by the chair. And to comply with other relevant provisions of part three of the 1982 loss. The 1982 loss neither explains what these incidental activities could be, nor does it list down the activities that ships and aircraft are to, are to refrain from when exercising their normal modes of continuous and expeditious transit. Now, coming to another uh, uh, book, the San Remo Manual, this manual states that countries in conflict are encouraged to keep clear of rare or fragile ecosystems and habitats of depleted, threatened, or endangered species or other forms of marine life, which is similar to Article 194, Paragraph 5 of the Loss Convention. The due regard standard used throughout the loss convention is also used in this manual. But when the manual is read with Article 39, Paragraph 1C, there is an inconsistency. The main thrust of the manual is that states engaged in armed conflict must conserve the marine environment. In situations of distress or first measure, Article 39, 1C of loss does not seem to provide for the conservation of the marine environment. To this extent, perhaps, Article 39.1 needs to be reworded for the effective regulation of the marine environment. On the use of force, the case of MV Saiga number two is relevant. This case, though, deals with the use of force in the EEZ for exercise of contiguous zone jurisdiction rights. In the MV Saiga number two case, the majority judgment of the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea held that Guinea had used excess force on the Saiga. As the MV Saiga uh, case number two was between St. Vincent and the, and the Grenadines and Guinea, St. Vincent and the Grenadines claimed that Guinea's arrest of their ship, the Saiga, was accompanied by excessive un and unreasonable show of force as Guinean authorities had fired at the ship. Guinea counter-argued, saying that the gunfire was the last resort as the Saiga refused to stop after repeated radio messages and visual and auditory signals from Guinea's patrol boat. The International Tribunal examined the rules of international law and concluded that though the loss did not contain express provisions on the use of force in the arrest of ships. International law, which was applicable by, by virtue of Article 293 of the Convention, required that the use of force must be avoided as far as possible. And where force was unavoidable, it must not go beyond what was reasonable and necessary in the circumstances. Considerations of humanity must apply in the law of the sea, as they have done in other areas of international law. Likewise, the issue of signals to, to stop a ship during hot pursuit, a right related to contiguous zone jurisdiction, is unclear in its application to straits used for international navigation. For hot pursuit in the EEZ in the Saiga number two case, it was recognized that first an auditory or visual signal to stop must be given and radio signals were excluded. The right of hot pursuit and the right of transit passage are difficult to reconcile if coastal state interests are not upheld. Article 111 on, of loss on hot pursuit does not refer to straits used for international navigation. However, if the pursued ship is in the internal waters or in the contiguous zone of a straight state, then the pursuing warship or military aircraft may pursue the vessel into the strait. This should not interfere with the right of transit passage of the vessel, as in a conflict with the right of hot pursuit, the hot pursuit began first. International law of the sea principles of jurisdiction that need to be reconciled with the right of transit passage and straight state rights and straight use for international navigation are many, such as flag state jurisdiction, the territorial jurisdiction including customs jurisdiction, 
the nationality jurisdiction, the protective jurisdiction, the passive personality jurisdiction, and so on. Now the rights and duties of user states in relation to the freedom of navigation. User states have unlimited and maximized freedom of passage. Under Articles 41 and 42, straight states are required to provide safe navigation and regulate traffic. They are to implement and give effect to international marine pollution conventions, including pollution by oil and noxious substances. They are to harmonize national legislation of straight states with the convention. They are to control fishing vessels, prevent and regulate the storage of fishing gear, and the loading or unloading of any commodity, currency, or person, which incidentally is a reference to contiguous zone jurisdiction. But the standard of responsibility of the flag state is unclear in the convention. It is to be noted that the exercise of criminal jurisdiction by straight states interferes with the right of transit passage. Therefore, how would straight states control and suppress crimes like smuggling, human trafficking, illegal immigration, or IUU fishing, as was referred to yesterday, without impairing transit passage in the states, in the straits? It is also to be noted, as the previous speaker has pointed out, that in the straits of Malacca and Singapore, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia have cooperated in the Malcindo operations for the control of piracy and armed robbery in these waters with some success. There are details on the uh, transit passage and air law and archipelagic sea lanes passage in my paper, which I will not refer to now. On the rights and duties, jurisdiction and discretion of straight states, I wish to raise a few considerations. First, the implications of part three of the 1982 convention. Article 44 of the convention provides that straight states cannot hamper transit passage and are required to give publicity to all dangers of navigation and overflight within or over the strait of which they have knowledge. Now what is the knowledge of a strait? The 1982 convention does not define knowledge or knowledge of a state. However, the rules of general international law as reflected in the customary law decision in the Coffee Channel case would be relevant here. On discrimination, safety of navigation, self-defense, punishment, tolls, and contiguous zone jurisdiction, the rule is that straight states cannot discriminate against foreign ships, but are required to enhance safety of navigation and initiate cooperative arrangements to improve the safety of navigation. Straight states are not empowered under part three to take enforcement action for a violation of article 40, which prohibits research and survey activities during transit passage by ships or aircraft. Neither are they allowed under loss to punish ships that violate a 3.5 meter under keel clearance according to the interpretative statement to article 233. 233, or to levy tolls for the upkeep of navigational facilities. Now, on the 3.5 meter underkill clearance, which is not a rider to Article 233, there are two interpretations by Co and Scovasi. I'll come to them later. With regard to Articles 41 to 44 of the Convention, these articles refer to the procedures and options for straight states that intend to provide for sea lanes and traffic separation schemes in straits with the approval of international governance structures such as the IMO. This brings me to the rights uh, on the, as a continuation of the rights, juris duties, jurisdiction, and discretion of straight states, the protection and preservation of the marine environment. Now here, I stress, if it's possible, that naval cooperation for the conduct of baseline studies for the protection and conservation of the marine environment and its resources be considered. The basis for action would be under Article 39, Paragraph 2, Clause B, which refers to 
flag or user states, uh, flag or user states requirement to comply with pollution regulations on board ships. It is also considered under Article 40, which says that flag states can carry out research or survey under this article with straight state consent. And finally, this proposal is made under Article 43, Paragraph B, which calls for cooperation for the prevention, reduction, and control of pollution from ships. I stress on these three articles, 39 b Article 40, and Article 43, Paragraph B, because in, paragraph, in Part 13 on Marine Scientific Research, in Section 3, this section refers only to the territorial sea in Article 245 and makes no reference whatsoever to the regime of straits used for international navigation. Now, straits, uh, straight states desiring to prevent marine pollution are generally directed to Part 12 and Article 233, entitled Safeguards with Respect to Straits Used for International Navigation. Article 233 states that nothing in Sections 5, 6, and 7 affects the legal regime of straits used for international navigation. This leads to an awkward interpretation that there is no duty on the part of straight states to control pollution from the various sources mentioned in Section 5. If Sections 5, 6, and 7 do not apply to straits, and the phrase major damage within the section remains undefined, the inference seems to be that a straight state cannot take enforcement action against the impugned vessel. The next question that arises is, how would a straight state take enforcement measures and respect Article 233, Mutatis Mutandis. The 1982 Law of the Sea Convention does not address this issue. Part three of the Lost Convention does not have an environmental formula that addresses the issue of marine pollution by foreign flagships and the right of straight states to suspend the right of transit passage for this purpose. Part three also does not cross-reference to part 12 or to Article 233. There is also no mention of liability in Part 3. Article 233 and reworded and Part 3 should complement each other. Article 236 of Part 10 states that the provisions on the protection and the preservation of the marine environment do not apply to any warship, naval auxiliary, other vessels or aircraft owned or operated by a state and used only for the time being on government or non-commercial purposes. These ships are totally immune from the jurisdiction of straight states and from Article 333. They are only subject to flag state jurisdiction. Now, the principles of marine environmental law for uh, such cooperation with the Navy is as follows. The principles of conservation of the living resources of the sea are well encapsulated at international law in cases such as the San Juan River case, 1888, the Bering Sea Fur Seals case of 1893, the North Atlantic Coast Fisheries case, 1910, the Trail Smelter Arbitration case, 1938 to 41, the Corfu Channel case of 49, the Gapchikovo Nagimaros case, 1997, and most recently, the pulp mills on the River Uruguay decision 2010 of the ICJ. Of fairly recent origin, the concept of sustainable development evolved from the UN Conference on the Human Environment or the Stockholm Declaration 1972, the Rio Conference and Rio Declaration 1992, endorsed by 194 states. Agenda 21, Chapter 17, endorsed by 178 states. The World Summit on Sustainable Development and the Future We Want, 2012, endorsed by 191 states, compel us to uphold 
the precautionary, preventive, and polluter pace principles as they continue to exert their influence on the 1982 loss convention. The 1982 loss does not contain provisions in part three that uphold the marine environmental law on behalf of the straight states. It may be worthwhile considering whether there should be recommendations to amend the loss to reflect these marine environmental law principles. Therefore, the marine environmental law principles that I allude to comprise customary international law, the principle of sustainable development, international law, such as state responsibility for internationally wrongful acts, and international environmental law. The way forward that I plead is for naval cooperation for the protection and conservation of the marine environment. The question is whether navies can engage in a civilian lawful purpose such as protection and conservation of the environment. In this way forward, there is a need to determine the geographical, personal, material, temporal, and personal scope of each action and the real politic of a given region. For example, for the conduct of baseline census on vessel sourced pollution under Article 211 of loss in the region, through naval cooperation may be considered. This includes coastline protection and pollution damage to the related interest of coastal states under paragraph two. It would require knowledge of the history and the background of ships and the capacity of each to handle pollution under MARPOL. It would require access and boarding of ships. At this point, I recall that Dr. Mary Ann Palmer had said that many fishing vessels or some fishing vessels had suffered from excessive use of force by some naval uh, vessels. However, the plea here is that we need to determine with a great deal of care the geographical, the personal, the material, the temporal, and the personal scope of each action that we recommend. Other areas that could similarly invite naval cooperation are the regulation of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing in areas where there is no regional fishery management organization for the conduct of a first-time census of fishing vessels for the establishment of a regional fishing vessel list. Fishing vessels with their gear stowed away have a right of transit through straits and they are not subject to the jurisdiction of the coastal state. However, the coastal state may through naval assistance be entitled to check by, ins by visual inspection that the vessel is not engaged in any fishing activity so as to assure the integrity of the sovereign rights of the coastal state concerning fishing. In conclusion, this paper considered the challenges faced by the strait states as their territorial seas lost that status in exchange for the regime of straits used for international navigation, where the stronger doctrine of transit passage prevails. Transit passage rights of ships and aircraft, these delete spacecraft, which I have not defended in this paper, need to be reconciled with the straight state's rights, duties, and discretion, not only to exercise contiguous zone rights in, this, in these straits, but also for the protection and preservation of the marine environment of the straits. It challenges the navies to respond to this civilian call through the demarcation of the geographical zone and personal and material scope of each of those actions to uphold the due diligence and due regard obligations of all states in the marine, en in the marine environment of the Straits. Thank you. <laughs>